In the name of Jesus, amen. It's not easy being a Christian. There is the external pressures to succumb to the ways of this world. There is the pressure to reject the faith, to capitulate to whatever wind of false doctrine or philosophy is blowing. And for some, there is downright or outright oppression as freedom to worship is taken away. Some are thrown into prison and others are not only threatened with death but actually killed for the faith. But when I say it's not easy to be a Christian for you, these external pressures, and even if repression were to come, is nothing compared to another threat. Death cannot tear you away from Christ. The devil can't harm you unless you listen to his lies. Far worse than anything that this world, the devil, or even any of their servants can throw your way is an internal enemy. The Bible tells you that your sinful flesh is the greatest enemy to your faithfulness. It's because the flesh doesn't listen. You have your own ideas, you have your own ways, you have your own priorities. For example, your flesh would rather read the paper than read the scriptures. Your flesh would have you skip your prayers and instead eat your lunch, lunch in a hurry so you can get on with whatever else you have to do. When the weekend rolls around, play that measuring game and your old Adam says that you've earned a break this week, especially from any effort it might take to get here for praise and thanksgiving. Bigger priorities, more important things to do. And at times, Jesus and his word can wait. That's because your old Adam, your flesh, also makes compromises. It's full of excuses. Too easy to find something or someone else who's more important. And that's because by very nature, according to the scriptures, your flesh wants nothing to do with Jesus and his word. Now you know this conflict all too well. For most of you, you've lived it, it seems, your whole life. This conflict begins in your baptism. Because in your baptism, you're given a new man, Christ Jesus, who lives and dwells in you, all the while holding on to that old man, flesh and bone, until you die. And so as Luther would have you remember, each day you drown the old Adam in your baptism. Each day beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Not just God's name, but God's name placed upon you as he named you as one redeemed by Christ the crucified. I pray each morning that you would keep me this day from all sin. That is to say that by your baptism, God would put to death the old Adam and bring to life again for you a new man who is faithful, whose priorities are in line, who loves the neighbor before oneself. But as Dr. Luther said, your old Adam is a damn good swimmer. Try to put him under the water, keeps getting back up to the top. Now again, this new man was given to you in baptism, and it seems to be a small voice of the pastor speaking a name and applying some water as God is doing it. This new man is absolutely opposed to the old man. They disagree with, every, with one another at every point. And again, that's because the new man in Christ, that is God's own word, is absolutely opposed to everything that the old man, your flesh, believes. But again, this new man comes through baptism. 
And to us, it seems that the new man then is weak. And the flesh and blood, which we know too, all too well, is the stronger one. But even that is a lie that your flesh tells you that somehow the word is the weaker. In reality, the word of God, your baptism, is living, active, powerful, and sharp. The stronger man casting out the strong man. In reality, your flesh is weak and dying. And the new man in Christ, which is yours, is strong and ever living. But this is not known by observation, not by our reason. It is known by faith, and faith that comes by hearing. Consider today's gospel. St. Peter has been listening to Jesus preach from his boat to the crowds gathered on the shore of Gennesaret. Jesus has preached about the kingdom of God. He has foretold his future death and resurrection. He has promised the forgiveness of sins in his shed blood and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the fire that will come upon them. And he's made promises of heavenly joys, a kingdom that will have no end. St. Peter has heard these words, and the Spirit has worked faith in his heart, or at least the beginnings of faith. Because then Jesus gives him what seems to be a quite clear word. Put into the deep and let that down your nets for a catch. Not hard. Simple instructions from Jesus. Easy. Just put out the boat, drop the nets. Just do it. But look at Peter and his faith. Okay, Master. Whatever. I should remind you, we worked hard all night when the fishing is good and got nothing. And now it's the middle of the day and the deep. But whatever, we'll let down the nets and we'll just prove you wrong. He listens, but I would argue he only has the beginnings of trust, faithfulness. We know this is true of St. Peter. He would often vacillate in his faith, as we hear in the scriptures. On the one hand saying, you are the Christ, and then on the other, next breath even, saying, far be it from you, Lord, to die for me. That's what it means to be the Christ, Peter. I will go to death for you, he says, and then in just a heartbeat, he denies Jesus three times. Even three years walking with Jesus, listening to his every word, is enough, not enough catechesis to overcome St. Peter's flesh, his old Adam. Even after our Lord's resurrection and ascension, St. Peter needs to be rebuked by the untimely born St. Paul because he's holding to false teaching. There's a bias against the Gentiles. You see, faith, that is trust in Jesus, does not come easy. It's not easy being a Christian. Seems easy enough. Jesus calls, but then you stay home. Jesus says, follow me, and then you hesitate to go where he goes. Jesus speaks and only asks that you listen and you stop your ears. Ought to be sympathetic then with St. Peter today. Be patient, not only with yourself, but with others, both here in the congregation and outside our fellowship, who have what the Bible calls a deep struggle, the struggle of faith and unbelief, of belief and doubt. And that's because you can't drum up faith. You can't make yourself trust, as we heard last week. Jesus works faith in you. He gives you trust. 
That faith, again, is begun in you as the new man is granted to you in your baptism. That faith, that trust in Jesus is refreshed as you hear those sweet words of absolution. Your sins are forgiven. Your trust in Jesus is strengthened as, and nourished as he feeds you with his body and blood for faith and life and salvation. It's the living word of God, the stronger man, overcoming the strong man that is your flesh, working in you daily to create, sustain, preserve, and keep you in the faith until you die or he comes again. But to your ears, to your reason, to your strength, it seems that the way that Jesus works among you and in you is just a low whisper, like it was for Elijah. Elijah. Not an earthquake, not a wind that tears the mountains apart, not a wildfire, a low whisper. It's not all that impressive. It even seems he takes his sweet time. And that's, again, contrary to what we had hoped for. Our flesh demands signs and wonders, and Jesus gives us signs and wonders, but weak ones, it seems. We look also for spontaneous and extraordinary when he comes to us normally, ordinarily, procedurally, institutionally. The spontaneous conversion to faith is not the normal story in the Bible. I don't even think it happens. Even if the Lord did grant such a miracle, like he did on the, this day for St. Peter, for Andrew, James, and John as they were in their boats, look at what happened with them. Yes, they followed him, but they listened to him. They were catechized by him for many, many years. It was only the beginning. They bring in a great haul of fish, two boats worth, and all St. Peter can say is, depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. I acknowledge you to be a miracle worker, maybe even someone with God's own voice, but I can't bear to be with you. His master has been turned to Lord, but the Lord is not yet his Messiah or Christ. They are astonished at Jesus today, but they still have far to go. And we should be patient with them as our Lord was patient with them. If we're honest about our own capacity for doubt and for weakness of faith, of trust in Jesus, then we'll also find ourselves much more willing to be patient with others as they struggle. Again, conversion to faithfulness does not happen overnight. As a matter of fact, it takes a lifetime. Faith is strengthened through that lifetime of struggles, of worries, anxieties, of loss, of sickness, of death. All the while living, trusting in the word and gifts of Jesus. So then through everything that we experience, the word of God is creating, sustaining, and keeping us in faith that is trust in Jesus. It doesn't appear to be all that great, or all that magnificent, or a strong wind, again, that tears apart mountains, or an earthquake that shakes us to our foundations, or a wildfire that burns us hot. Again, ordinary, simple, a low, soft whisper. Yet faith must begin somewhere. It might be an extraordinary experience, like it was in today's Miraculous Catch, that might start it off, but what preserves it is the ongoing regular reception of God in his word. You may be converted to faith with a kind word of sympathy and love from a brother or sister, but it continues in you as it was begun in you in your baptism. the Lord working faith through ordinary means, casting his nets daily into your heart into the deep waters of this world. 
all the while pulling out Christians into his ark that is his holy church through water and with a voice of command. Jesus' response to Peter when he says, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord, is simple but so comforting. He says, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Live trusting in your baptism. Struggle against your flesh. Listen to me. Do whatever I tell you. You only think it's hard to be a Christian because your old Adam is lying to you day and night. But listen to me. The new man, the new man in Christ is stronger. He overcomes everything that gets in his way. So when he says, follow me, he gives to you to follow him. When he says, be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in you, he gives you the defense for the hope that is in you. When he says, let your mind dwell on me richly through songs and hymns and spiritual songs, he gives you psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to sing. When he says, do not neglect to care for your congregation, he gives you the means to care for your congregation. You see how God works in you, love. He puts his love in your heart so that you have love for one another. And it's in this love that trust is worked, trust in Jesus, so that you will leave behind all things. To love God above everything and thus obtain all his promises. And it's only in Jesus, trust in him, that there is true and lasting peace. Peace that passes all surpasses all understanding that will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.